Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I want to take this time to introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Cook. He is a native of uh, Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Graduated from the Louis, uh, University of Louisville School of Dentistry in 1995. After graduation, Dr. Cook served six years as an officer of the U.S. Navy as a general dentist, where he attained the rank of lieutenant commander, served our country in North America and Europe, and had the privilege to work with the uh, Surgeon General of the Navy in Washington, D.C. Uh, he received specialty training at the University of Louisville Graduate Endodont Program. In 2003, Dr. Cook opened Hillsdale Endodontics in Whitest Knobs, Indiana. Yeah. Floyd Knox. Floyd Knox, Indiana. Where you came the city, <laughs> he built a successful practice and decided to relocate to Louisville to be near his growing family. Uh, the acquisition and growth of Louisville and Adontics is paramount in his belief to providing care, compassionate care, while maintaining value for service he provided. He and his wife, Tammy, a Louisville native, are the proud parents of three children, Mattingly, Graves, and Finley. And Dr. Cook is a member of the American Association of Endodontics, the American Dental Association, the Kentucky Dental Association, Louisville Dental, Dental Association, and the past president of the Southern Indiana Dental Association. Uh, during the past 17 years, Dr. Cook has lectured across the country, conducted numerous continuing education courses in endodontics. He also taught endodontics to dental and postgraduate students at the University of Louisville uh, School of Dentistry. Other interests include hunting, fishing, diving, and running. That's really cool. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. As every good Kentucky kid does, he hunts and fishes. I guess that's kind of the thing. That's, uh, but uh, I just want to say, number one, thank you all. We do say for bringing me out here. I appreciate it. Um, what an incredible facility you have here. I was doing a little research, uh, and, and it's, it's amazing. You all have been around for a long time. My dad's 86, and he's a year seven years older than him, right? So that's that's awesome. So kudos to you all uh, for continuing the education mission. Thank you. Um, also, thank you for commenting for bringing me out here because uh, without them, I wouldn't be here as well. And uh, we'll get into what they do. What I want to say first of all is, you guys, this is an open class, right? So this is this participatory. Don't feel like you can't ask a question anytime you have a question. Shout it out. I don't care. You're not going to bother me. Uh, just pretend like we're sitting around dinner and, and having a conversation, okay? Just you just get to look at some slides. So, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today is uh, a few things. So, one is introduction to the procedural endodontic techniques, is what we'll talk about with the equipment that we have here. Also, I'm going to start off with uh, a, a nice little um, talk about diagnostics, diagnostic techniques. Really, I used to call this 20 years ago. I called this how how do I do a root canal, right? And so it kind of walks through the start to the finish of, of out there being the doc therapy, I found over the years that the most well, it is the most important thing that that is one of the hardest things was for me to really grasp um, was diagnostics, right? And so that that's where this really most of this uh, lecture came from. Uh, my disclosure: I'm 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 paid to be here. Uh, I'm also a key opinion leader for Comet. Uh, found in USA. And what does that mean? Honestly, the way I look at it is nothing. Um, I'm a, it, people, my friends that know me, I'm an open book. I say exactly what I think uh, and exactly how I feel. If I don't like something, I'll tell people. And if I do like something, I'll tell people. Right. So uh, with that being said, uh, I never want to make this, this is not a sales, uh, sales lecture. Right? This is something that I, I believe in. I've used like the Endopilot and the products I've used. I've used Endopilot uh, two years before it was even introduced to the United States. Um, and that's why I'm here. <clears throat> why, you know, why do I do what I do? Why do we all do what we do? For me, um, give you a little background. That's my wife, Tammy. You know, she's from Louisville. And then I've got three kids. That's Maddie. I need to update the pictures because. These are probably about four or five years old. My, my Maddie is 18, uh, Briggs, he's 16, and Finley. She's our, our third child and everyone. But if you have three kills, children, you know that the third one's wellness, right? That's that's our wellness. And she is, uh, they're, they're all incredible kids. Uh, this is why I do it, to support them, you know, is to make them uh, hopefully look at their dad and say, hey, he's, he's, he's doing something good. He's 
but um, it's, uh, and I talk about it, my faith is my, my most important thing in the whole world. Uh, my family is second, and then endodontics, which I love endodontics. I never thought I would ever say that. I, when I was in college, you know, if people always ask me all the time, how did you become an endodontist? And I was like, yeah, you have a couple hours, and I won't take a couple hours. But when I was in high school, Here's a deep dive into Chris Cook, right? So when I was in high school, um, I was I was always I feel like I was always pretty smart, but I wasn't really uh, aggressive in my learnings, right? So my guidance counselor told me after test taking, I every time every time I took a standardized test, I ranked in the top one one tenth of one percent in, in, in the country every single time. My grades didn't reflect that, so I was told by my guidance counselor, "You might be a good garbage garbage man." It was it was a pretty big garbage man, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's that was my that was my bar. Right? Went to college, kind of messed around. My mom said, You're going to college, it's not even a question, right? So went to college. Um, you know, you have to have some things that I had a girl one day, she said, You need to do something better than what you what you're doing. It was just she was my girlfriend at the time, not my wife, but she was a girlfriend in college. That turned things around again. I had a motorcycle wreck that almost killed me, I had a car wreck that almost killed me with about a year apart. I thought I, there's something else that I need to be doing in here with my life because this this isn't working, right? So buckle down, biology major, chemistry major, um, and I have a, a minor in fashion merchandising and art history. So uh, kind of a weird subject, right? So but if I, I keep think, thinking if I go back one year, if I go back for one more class at Western Kentucky University, I'll actually have a triple major. I'll have another major in fashion merchandising. I don't think that'll get anywhere. I don't dress myself. I don't, I can't. It's I know nothing about it. My wife laughs at me every time I say that because I know nothing about it anymore. But with that being said, what is my job in, in this in this lecture today? What is my job? And Dr. Schwartz out of San Antonio, Texas, said it best one time, and I copied it from him. It's my job to make the pain. It's not just to sit there and kind of soak it in and, and just say, okay, what is he going to talk about next? My job is to make you think about what I'm saying. So that you can, we can process it and come up with answers as to why we do what we do. Um, but when he said that, it, it made me think that is, that's what every lecture should be, right? Is to sit there instead of just kind of go, oh, I'm just passing the passing the time to get my six hours or my however. What 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 are your old CE requirements? Maybe 20, 20 or thirty hours, twenty hours a year, maybe or ten hours a year, twenty five a year. That's awesome. In Kentucky, it's fifteen a year. In Indiana, I have a license there. It's ten hours a year. Not enough. Right? My first year in the in the military, um, I had 800 hours my first year, and I had 900 hours my second year. So I was one third. So that's and they made it available for me. So that was awesome. Um, I'm glad to hear that you guys have something like higher than the national average. I used to say with this slide, this is uh, when my job is to make you think. I used to say, this is my son not thinking. Uh, I, but again, that's what I thought when I walked down on them. I got a call. This was at our, we had a lake house down in, um, in central Kentucky. And this is a little um, side by side. And they were in the creek. My son's right here in the green shirt. That's one of our neighbor's kids. And there's a, there's a, like a, an eight year old in the, in the seat, right? It's like, what's, what's going on? So my first thought is, you guys aren't thinking. Right? But what I realized was my son was the one driving. The other kid was in the other seat, and the little kid was just kind of sitting there hanging out by the side watching. And all the girls, all my girls were running around, and they were running in front, trying to get them to stop. On a steep grade on the gravel road, as we're coming down the hill, Briggs had two choices. One was to drive it off into the creek or to run over the girls. So did they? You know, it, it's, it, thank God it didn't turn out terrible. But um, so Briggs is holding the thing. They got the eight year old to hop in because he was the lightest to press on the brake to keep it from going further. So it, it, it worked out well, no one was hurt. So it, they were thinking, even though it could have turned out really ugly. Um, so here's here's Kentucky probably looks, hey, honestly, when I was driving down here, uh, it looks not, not too much different to me. And Louisville, this is Louisville, Kentucky. That's my office is just over here on the lower right side. That's my car. That's how it looks every morning when I arrive. Uh, I'm always the first to get there, the last to leave. Uh, and that's the whole complex. There are three buildings like that. And I guess John Olmsted said, well, said put up a picture like this when I saw him speak back in the late 90s. He said, I was, I'm always the first one to show up. I'm the last one to leave. It's a source of pride, I think, um, where uh, I'm just 
I'll, I'll, I'll try it out and work at it anyone and everyone I can. And that's just, that's, it, it doesn't hurt to try to work a little harder sometimes. And when you work harder, the nice part is, is um, your playtime is that much more enjoyable, right? When we were out, a friend of mine, he played in the NFL. He, he always talked about your time away from home versus your, your family time versus your work time. And one thing if I get to, you're thinking, are we talking about endodontics today or are we just talking about nothing? We'll look at nothing. Um, one thing he said, which, which really hit home, was um, dividing up your time. You know, oh, I spend 50% of my time at work, 33% of my time at work, 33% of the time with my family, 33% of the time is where I'm sleeping. Um, and he, he put it a little differently, which made me re realize it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, I get up early, I go to work, uh, I give 100% of my time when I'm at work. When I leave, I leave, I leave work at home. I go home, I give 100% of my time to my family. Right? And then when I'm sleeping, I'm sleeping. It's important. Right? So, that's, so it's, it's, it adds up to 300%. But, but that's okay. Uh, things that have made my life easier in endodontics. So here we're actually getting into the intellectual. Anyone have any questions at all? Now that we get to talk about routine. Things that have made my life easier in endodontics. I'd, I'd also like to retitle this, Time to Retire If I Don't Have These Things. And, I, and this is 100% factual um, because I've sat down long and hard and thought, what if I don't have this, how much of an incremental uh, increase in my in my uh, ability to do root canals um, is is based upon these things. The first one is my diagnostic techniques, and we see it all the time. And whenever I see a tooth that is coming that has already had a root canal, the number one thing is I will never judge anyone that's ever done a root canal, no matter what it looks like, because I've had teeth that I get done, you go cool probably could have done better, so I go back in and I try to make it better. Sometimes I know that's the best I can do with what I have, right? So I'll never judge, I'll judge my work, but I'll never judge anyone else's work. So if something comes in that looks like, what were they thinking? I never, that, I can put that right out of my head because the answer is, I don't know. I don't know the circumstances or the situation, so I never, I never even give it a second thought. I'm starting from ground zero when I see that patient, so I can figure out what's going on then. We can always kind of re reverse engineer things and figure out why it happened, but that, that's the past. We're not living in the past. Uh, CBCT. Um, if you don't have one, that's okay. Uh, I didn't have one. I didn't buy one. I didn't have one in my office until 2018. I have the ability to use them through the dental school because uh, I had Bruno Azevedo, who is now in an endodontic residency. He was a dental radiologist for 22 years. He went back to work. He went back to Einstein. He's now in the second year of his endo residency at Einstein with Fred Barnett. Um, Bruno is in endodontics is the number one guy with bone beam computer tomography in the world. He's, you know, he's, you can go to Jay Marita, ask the CEO of Jay Marita, do you know who Bruno Azevedo is? He's my best friend of yours. He's, they're, they're, he's, he's unbelievable. He's got a website called, uh, I think it's called conebeamguy.com, and he reads cone beams. He still reads cone beams, but he, he's, for the end of the community, he's an amazing person. Thank God he was at the University of Louisville, so I was able to sit down and use him as a reference. So if I had a question about a patient I didn't, I didn't know the answer to, I'd send it to a university where they have, they may have more now, but they had 18 cone beams, 18 different cone beams throughout the dental school. Um, and we still have Bill Scarf down there, who's just who was a great uh, person to have in my back pocket to help interpret things on CBCT. Now that we have it in our office, not every single person gets a symptom beam. I, part of me wishes I would, and that's that's my hang up, because um, I should, but I don't. But I try to do some things maybe the old fashioned way without the cone beam. Uh, I'm getting more, I'm, my utilization is 47%. So 47% of my patients will receive a company. Um, and there was a research study that came out that said, this is an endodontics, that when you take a scan, your outcomes, your, if you decide what you want to do with that patient, then you scan them, there's a 30% chance that you're going to change your, your idea of what you're going to do. It's 30% chance. That's, that's too high, you know, to not take a scan. So, but again, 
I don't. If, if there's very, I think you have a lot of straightforward cases. Um, microscope. I just come back off of a deployment. I was on a so a med, med cruise, a Mediterranean cruise with the Marine Corps in 1997. It was October, and I showed up to my clinic again, and um, Nate Bryant, Commander Bryant, is an endodontist in the Navy, pulled me aside. He said. What do you think? He saw something in me I didn't see. He said, "What do you think? How was how was your deployment?" It was great. How'd you like doing root canals? I said, "I tried it before. I pulled the teeth out." I was, I'm, you know, you're on a ship, rolling around, doing all this stuff. I've got hand files, inability to see. I took a shot. Here's the funny part. So, if you ever wanted to think dentistry, sorry, go on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and try to do a root canal, try to extract or anything. I can remember sitting there one day, we're in high seas, we're rocking back and forth. Patients in the chair, I lean over, I didn't strap the table, right? the arm, didn't strap that in. I do one of these things, the ship pitches, the table comes around, waxing right in the square center of the head, almost knocked me out, right? And I thought, I strapped it down, I said, pull the tube, I said, we're going to wait, I'm not going to see anybody until this ship gets to work. Um, but he said, how'd you like doing root canals? I hated it, I always hated it. I didn't have a good, you know, like in the early 90s, uh, residency, and this may be a lot of places. The residency said we're we're going to take most of our cases and give them to the residents. You just have to do five root canals to get out. And so I did my five, and I was done. Um, I didn't see the microscopes hanging on the, the corner in there. I just I didn't know. And so he, he looked at me and said, "So you don't like root canals?" I, said, I don't like root canals. He, he grabbed me, walked into my branch director's office. He said, "Hey." Uh, uh, I've got Chris for the next six weeks. I said, oh, why? I want to teach you how to do a root canal. So I'm going to learn how to do a root canal. Because you're, you're stupid. Yes, you sir. Sat me in, first day. Sat me in front of a microscope, 1997. I pull, pull it up, and I thought, oh, I can see. It's kind of like those videos you see at the end of the babies that get glasses for the first time, or the hearing aids for the first time, and the look on their face. That was the look on my face. And then he sat down and started teaching me about diagnostics. I had another guy, Rick, uh, uh, Rick Miller, same thing. He, he sat down, he was, he spent the time with me to teach me some of these things that were really so basic. Looking back, they were so basic, but I, you know, you know, I, I've been in middle school for two and a half years. And I thought, how come I don't know these things? It just it made me want to educate myself more. But being able to see what I can see with a microscope um, is a game changer. So from 97, Went to DC in 98. Uh, I had one day a week I was working in the clinic. I went between the Pentagon, the Navy Yard, and Bethesda, and I always worked with microscopes. From there, I went to Key West, Florida. That was my last duty station. I worked with an Army Special Ops team down there in a combat dive training situation, but I also saw patients, and I ordered a microscope. They let me order a microscope that I could do all my work underneath the microscope. I haven't stopped using microscopes since 97. I wouldn't change it at all. I tried to do a root canal one time without one. And oops. This is to me, to me, it's too dangerous um, because I'm not used to it right, anymore. Uh, what type of microscope? Yeah, the answer is whichever, whichever one works. I, I have, uh, I've had Zeiss. Our residency uses global. Uh, I bought Zeiss when I came out. My father's a photographer, and I always grew up hearing about Zeiss and Leica. So those were always the ones. So those are the ones I purchased. Uh, I went on to buy some Micas. I love those just for the design of them. Um, it's money well spent. It really is. I mean, it's, you can do general dentistry on, on, on them. The problem a lot of times with a microscope is when you start. Has anyone ever used a microscope? Does anyone ever? Nice. So when when you use when you use the microscope, your first right, couple of days, if not a week. You, just that, that part bubbling back and forth, it kind of messes with your head a little bit. You get a little dizzy. Uh, but after a while, your, your brain gets used to it. You know, after a while, you can just go back and forth easy. So everything, even in, from start to finish, injections all the way to the end attempt, I'm using a microscope. Some people just use it for access. I, I, I love them. Rotary files, um, you know, they've been around for longer than, honestly, they've been a lot around longer than I've been a dentist. But um, they're, they are a game changer. I still have friends that hand file. If that number keeps getting less and less every year, we ended on a team and hand files. 
I still know how to do it. I still grab hand files every once in a while. And I do that just so I can make sure I remember how to do it. It's like driving a stick shift, car. you know, that's what I learned on. And then most every car is now an automatic, but every once in a while, if I see a stick shift, I'll go out and drive it. Just so I can remember how to do it. Is it easy? Not as easy as I, as I remember, right? We'll talk about the rotary files. All these things we're going to talk about during this uh, this uh, talk as well. And the endopilot. And that sounds kind of weird, I think. Endopilot, I mean, that's just a piece of equipment. So it's a microscope. So all these things are a piece of equipment except for your diagnostics. I started using it in 2019. They sent one to my office. Tell me what you think about it. Do you, uh, and just see what you think. Do you want to work with the company or just let, let us know? So they taught me about it. I worked with a little, it's, it's a computer, right? Everything about that is a computer. And and it, there's some, some things that when you use it, um, you're gonna learn it, it's gonna learn you, right? You, there are things you can program in it that can change things around. If you get it out of the box and just start using it without any help, it'll probably not be the most enjoyable experience, right? So having this team who these guys are, I mean, the reality is we just had to. Uh, but I can already tell, and just by talking with others, that you guys are rock stars. And so I'm, I'm so glad that you're here because um, you lean on them. They know this stuff. Honestly, he's, you, you've been in you've been in dentistry longer than I've been in dentistry. Okay. So uh, you know their stuff. You know your stuff. Uh, lean on, them, right? I have a question, and they can teach you. Uh, if and if not, if you don't have the answer, they don't have the answer. They can call me. They can call John Olmsted. We've got a, a whole list of people that can help you out with these questions. At the end, I'm going to give you my cell phone number, email address, and I mean this 100%. I, I tell every patient this. Every patient gets my cell phone number when I, I'll never see him again. I get my cell phone number. I'm going to give it to you all. Please don't ever hesitate to reach out, email, call, text, whatever you want. I'll always be available. I'm going to be that second, and I'll get back to you. So it's, it's estimated around... This is in the United States annually, 25 million endodont procedures um, every year. That's kind of a staggering number, and, and so which makes me, my son's a math, he loves math. I like math, I don't love math, he loves math. So I'll throw things at him and we sit around and talk about different, uh, uh, not really statistics, he's not into that yet, he's, he's a junior in high school. But uh, we always just sit there and run numbers. I can just run, throw numbers at him and he throws them back at me. And we just kind of just, I didn't put it all in here, but it's 41,000 root canals every single day, seven days a week throughout the year. That's a, that's a, that's a, lot, of, that's a lot of root canals. 75% uh, are performed by general dentists. So if we look at that number, 25% are, are by endodontists. We kind of break that out a little bit. When we look at how many endodont, how many active, active dentists are in the United States, and it breaks it down by specialty. Uh, the reality is general dentistry and endodontics are the ones doing, obviously, 75% by that number up top. 5717 endodontists. Surgeons are probably not doing root canals. Others are probably not doing root canals. Um, pediatric dentists are doing some pulpotomies. They're doing some root canals out there, but not many. Uh, it equals out to, I don't think I wrote this number down because we were just talking about it yesterday, but it ends up being 5.14 root canals a week. And when you divide it out amongst general dentists, and then as far as ended on us, I, I, was, I was doing some numbers and I was counting up on this because when we look at the end of the United States, the first thing I saw, it said they were four, like, and this is, so these are the end of the that, that, that Spectre's Dental Review does a lot of this incredible, really great statistical analysis, different, um, just different things that probably aren't that important, but they said they were 41 end of the in Kentucky. And the first thing I thought was, no, there are, I'm in Kentucky, I know there are 41. So I went back through and I counted every single one of them. There are 26. So, so, so I'm sitting there going, all right, if, if I just take my state, it's a 63% accuracy rate. So maybe there are only 3,600 practicing endodontists. But when you look at all the active endodontists in the United States, we also include uh, educators. Right? We include people that maybe are working the day a week, people that are in research. So all these things that are there. So it's probably more of a likely number. But when I look at that and I look at, there are a lot of, California has the number one, 888 endodontists in the, in the United States. That's, that's a lot, right? So you have 15, 15 and a half percent of the endo population uh, for 11.7 percent of the U.S. population. So when I look at that compared to Kentucky, we need we need we need you know, we need 52 endodontists 
take care of our state, although we've got Eastern Kentucky, right? So Kentucky's the butt of the joke, right? Why they that why do they call it what, they invented the toothbrush in Kentucky? Here, you know why? Otherwise we've been kind of, it would have been called a toothbrush. <laughs> so um, but it's um so it just shows and I mean every time I come out to California, I love I love this place. It's a beautiful place. Um there's a difference between Northern California and Southern California people. There's a little bit of a fight between that, right? You've got the, the CDA, you've got the Southern part, the Northern part, and just the, the difference between the two. And, and it's, uh, my wife, if, if I called my wife right now and said, I've got a position in California, I should be packing bags to come out here right now. Okay. And I know there's, there's a difference. It's, it's funny. You know, it's, we get made fun of in Kentucky for a thousand different things, but sometimes we bring conservative with a lot of things like smoking and teeth and That's true. But as a matter of fact, that that the basketball tournament that's going on right now, TBT, have you all seen that? It's they've got all these groups or they're competing for a million dollars. And it's I think it's 64 teams competing for a million dollars. And so a bunch of my buddies have played in the 2013 national championship, which that is a national championship. I was just I was just working on one of them uh Tuesday. But he, he had an he had an issue had to be fixed, but they're they're getting ready to play on the 20. Yeah, I think so. Look out for a, a team in the TBT called Brazil. And so they're growing one of those. I was watching yesterday. There's some great teams in that. Um, let's see. That's what I was going to say. Kind of it, it, the, 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 the statistic that really blew me away was in the in the top in the top four states, and it, it was amazing that it that it lined up the way it did. It's pretty close. You know, 36 and a half percent of the endodontists are in four states. But that's also 33.4 percent of the population, so it's about it's about right, you know. And and those are all nice places to live. But um, when I looked at uh, we were at Laguna Beach one time, and my my wife said, "Why can't we live out here?" I said, "Because that house is 20 million dollars, and my house is 10 million dollars, and the house is this huge place." How? How do you how do you do that? Um, but um, I looked at also I looked at the amount of endodontists that were in a 150 mile radius. Out of, out of Laguna Beach, and of course that radius is half because it's half the Pacific Ocean. Same with it is here. So you've got that, and the amount of endodontists that were there versus you know it was it was it was equal to greater than the state of Kentucky, Ohio, and Michigan put together. So it was just like, cool, that's a lot. That's a lot of competition. Right? Um, but I was going to say, you know, there's something else I had to say, and I already went away, but I'll, I'll remember here. And I'll tell you guys in a second. But had to do with uh, you know had to do with California or root canals. But um, <laughs> let's go on. So here's a case. Um, this was 2004. Came into my office. It's obviously failing the distal root. Starting to fail the mesial root. There were no cone beams out at that time. They they were there at the university. I wouldn't even give it given it a second thought. They had three canals filled. Uh, this is a thermophil carrier based treatment. Uh, you can tell right up in the furcation, you're like, ooh, did they perforate the floor? Because it looks pretty deep. This was not my root canal. But uh, it came to me. Um, and I thought, I don't know, this, this, you know, you can make a case, especially nowadays, uh, on the distal of the distal root. It, it almost looks like there may be like a fracture. There are all these things that we're thinking could be going wrong with this too are going wrong. But the patient wanted to save it. I wanted to save it. That's my retreatment, little sealer puff on the distal. Um, is it the West Coast? You all like to see sealer puffs in April, like areas of bone loss, or do you not like them? Depending on the case. But I, it's back in 2003, it was like the West Coast likes to sealer puffs, the East Coast hates to sealer puff. It was a very, it was like a, it was like a rapper battle, right? It was back and forth. Um, but I, in a in a necrotic case with a radio recency, I kind of like to see a puff. I like that. Um, but we retreated it. We took a, a slight angle. So originally, we we thought this had what well, had three carriers and it had three canals. It actually had five canals. I could, I'd like to go back and get a scan on this guy because I, I gotta wonder if there was a mid mid mesial, right? There's a good chance. There's a real high percentage of mid mesials in these cases as well. You saw me a year later. It doesn't really matter because it healed. That's great. You know. So so maybe there wasn't maybe there wasn't, but it certainly worked. 
So free treatments obviously work. I've got friends of mine who went out in 1996. I was in 2000. Um, with, the, with the advancement in endodontics, dentistry is advancing at such a rapid rate. And now the thing we're thinking about is AI, right? That's the big thing with CBCTs is AI. So we're looking at, and they're doing it in, in medical radiology now, where uh, or they can do an MRI, they can do a uh, CAT scan, and they're getting reports back from a computer saying, here's what to look for, here's what you think's there. And they're like, because of all the information you put in, they're, 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 they're finding things that maybe we would miss. We're going to look at that a little closer, let's rescan it, because I think there's something there. And they're finding that. And it's coming into, it's coming into, uh, there's a guy named Mike Bueno out of Brazil who has come up with, a, they've just come up with this incredible, these filters looking for the CBCTs. Uh, and the more information they get, the more information that's sent to them, the more they can put and diagnose it, and the, heart, and the AI is going to come up. We don't want it to get so much. That's scary. It's scary. We talk about AI. It's a little scary. I don't want to. I don't want to scan someone and have a computer hit me in the face and say, "Hey, you missed this." But I want to be able to know what's going on um, with 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 these scans. So, you know, with that, I think in the next few years you're going to see um, the, the radiology part of what we're doing increase. Here's another case. This, what this case really, I don't know what I was going to say. Did anyone here go to UCSF Dental School? Awesome. Um, one of my classmates teaches there. I think she was in the AGD program. Her name is Poppy Singh. Does that name sound familiar? Maybe. Her last name was Singh. Her, it was, uh, her, her nickname's Poppy, but it's uh, Jody, J Y O T I. Uh, I think she's still there. She was a late bloomer. She was in our class, started Dental School 38. I graduated 20 years ago, so she may not be there anymore. I know she still is up here. I just thought I'd run that by her only because she, she's a dear friend. She's a, she's a dear friend now with the team that you got her. She's a, she's a great person. The reason for this, this radiogram to show you is that what do we look at for healing? And so some of the things when we're looking at this, what's the first thing you just someone shout out, what's the first thing you look at when you see this? So, and that's this, and that's what we're trained as dentists, right? So, what are we looking at first? Teeth, right? Something I learned from Bruno, and I think it's it's uh, you're exactly right. Easy buckle on, on number fourteen has got a radio lucency there, um, and that's what we're trained at. What he kind of fixed me to do differently is look at everything but the teeth first. And so, the first thing that I would see is the maxillary sinus completely full, right? And, and so this this is a this is I'm sorry this is skin. Um, so this area of high density that's in the maxillary sinus, and in Kentucky we're in the Ohio Valley, so everyone has allergies. Every single if you scan, 80% of the population will look like this, uh, not quite like this. But we retreated that tooth, and a month later uh, we're already seeing healing. But the most important thing we're seeing is that there's no fullness in the maxillary sinus. So that's the, the, the big thing is I have, we probably have people come in all, I don't know about here. I mean, is our allergies bad here? Yeah. Are they? Okay. So people come in all the time. Yeah, they treat me for a sinus infection. They treat me, you know, I'm on antibiotics for sinus infection. I saw a patient call me this morning. I need an antibiotic. Why? I need, tell me why. Oh, I, I, my sinus hurts. Well, what is it? Oh, that's my tooth. Are you sure? Yeah. I, I, I mean, can I, can I see it first? I mean, I'm not going to call you an antibiotic. Number for sinus infection, and if it's a tooth, I want to see and figure out what's going on. I just I don't like to just randomly go out and prescribe antibiotics. Um, I am, let me show you before, before, after. Um, I'll tell you a reason for answering this one probably five times. Um, I don't, I'm not the guy to call for antibiotics. And even when they leave me, I have a, a colleague of mine that's in, and he's an incredible endodontist. He graduated dental school the same year. Every single person that gets a root canal leaves with an antibiotic and a steroid. Every single person. Um, and I told him, John, yeah, I think that's a bad idea. So I don't get, I don't get calls. You know, and that's why. I don't want to get called. And my oral surgery friends, those are extractions. You know, for the longest time, it was it was a pain pills and an antibiotic. Why? And I do it. Why? Resorbable sutures. I just don't want to see them again. Why don't you want to see them again? Because they'll be fine and it'll be even more fine. I won't get the call. That. I said, I'd rather have the call. And they said, why do you want the call? 
I said, because I don't get that many calls twice a year. Honestly, I get, I get calls twice a year um, for people that are hurting. And I go and I see them. But I don't do uh, antibiotics, and it's personal. And my mom, back in 2003, she was compromised with breast cancer treatment and chemo and all that stuff. It kept hitting with antibiotics, kept hitting with antibiotics. And she, she prided herself. I get my antibiotic, I go in the next day for a shot for my, my immune therapy that's going to boost my immune therapy so my white blood cell count doesn't drop and all these, all these other things, um, which is fine. Again, I, I get it. There's, there's, we're trying to, you know, cancer, the treatment can kill the patient as much as it can kill the cancer. She was doing well. She had antibiotic therapy, and within 24 hours, she was dead. But we've all heard these stories, right? I wrote them, you know, and it's usually, honestly, the times I've heard of it is a dentist writes it for his father-in-law, and they're dead within 24 hours of a seat of infection. Um, it happened to me personally. That's that's my perception on it. Is it a little too far one way than another? Probably so. You know, probably so. Uh, but that's that's why I question that. Um, you know, when we look back, I have a friend of mine in Minnesota. She lectures all over the world for... Uh, Talk about uh, all the, you know, the biggest uh, opioid addiction place was Eastern Kentucky. There were mills all over the place over there. And that, that's the addiction in Eastern Kentucky is off the charts. And the mills weren't helping it. Physicians went and set it up and said, I'm making a ton of money just writing prescriptions all day long. But they out there on this energy on that. But it also, the addiction of it, the majority of it came from oral surgery. And I'm not bashing oral surgeons, but it's just everyone got their wisdom teeth out. They got a prescription. There's a percentage of those people who are going to be addicted after the first painful. Right? And my friend in Minnesota, uh, Angie Rake, she's the president of the board of dentistry. She's an oral surgeon up in Minnesota. She lectures on it, and it's real near and dear to her her heart because her brother is was a real successful a real successful lawyer in Dallas, Texas. And for spine surgery, got a prescription for an opioid. He now lives on the streets in Seattle. Homeless. They don't know where he is. They, they kind of know where he is, but not really. He's homeless. I mean, he gave up everything for his addiction. So and it was, it was, it's not, I'm not blaming anybody. It, it sucks, right? It's just, it's not, not good to see when we see it. And the addiction is, is just, you know, we want to try to figure out how to, how to fix this. And how to get this. Just awareness. So, but hopefully they didn't like, oh, we'll bring everybody down. But um, uh, next, here's another two. Speaking of my friends, so my friends, they're, it's a husband-wife couple, Scott and Angie Rake. So Angie's on CNBC. She's all over the world lecturing on opioid no addiction. And, uh, she's, she's, she's a brilliant person. Uh, but here's another two things. They send me a lot of these pictures that come in that you think, well, what was this? And it's like, well, is that a, that's a weird kind of a lateral canal or a sensory canal? Or, you know, what the heck's going on there? And, they, and they, that's the picture they sent. It was a fractured root, but also it's, uh, it's got a purchase sticking on the side. That tuna obviously is coming out. Uh, it, it was it was fractured, um, but it was it was also you know maybe tracing the gutta percha in a different sort of way. Right? Something I think that if I had to guess, who all here has ever seen a resorption case? Yeah. When um, when I was a general dentist, I never. I, I remember reading about it, hearing about it. I'd never seen one. Uh, my first case I saw was my first year of residency. And then my first, so my first external case, then my first internal case was my second year of residency. And I got out into private practice in 2003. And about once a year, I would see a case. Of course, everything kind of gets funneled to me, right? So, so most people that I would talk with, they're like, well, that's the first time I've ever seen this before. And I've been practicing for 10, 15 years. But because when you have two, three hundred people referring to you, you're going to get that one a year. Okay, what, what, what do you think? Obviously, this, so number 29 to 28. 28 has uh, invasive cervical resorption. Uh, that is, that if we did a scan on that, it would be amazing to see exactly how much bone loss there is there. That is a non historical too. So what, I, what I was want to say is I may see, and I don't know what it is, and I'm not a, I'm not a conspiracy theory theory guy. I'm not any of that stuff. But all I'm saying is, uh, since COVID, I see a, 
I see cervical resorption. I see external resorption once a week. Once a week, and I, 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 I don't. Nobody knows why, you know, we, but we do. And it's it's amazing to see. And the hardest part is when you see it. And I've seen it on every two. It used to be certain teeth. Usually, this this tooth right here would, would have it. Uh, this can happen in a week. And that's that's another hard part. You can take a uh, you can take a PA or a bite wing, and it was it looks great. And then the patient goes, you know, my tooth kind of looks pink right there. That's weird. And it could be a couple months later, and this and this is it. This happens so rapidly. It turns off. It turns on. Nobody knows. There's I used to give us uh, what was it? A lecture on resorption, and I refuse to give it because it's the most boring lecture in the world. And there's no answer. It's the you know it's the it's the it's the song that has no end. It just we don't really know why. There's there there were a thousand suspected reasons for resorption cases. One is even uh, uh, if you own a cat, if you have a cat with feline herpes. Have you all heard that? Have, have you heard that? That's kind of the running joke. Uh, it was a French study. And they, they traced it back. It's almost like um, there, was, there was a study out of Harvard about 10 years ago. It said, it said if, you have a, if you had a panorex, you're susceptible to a glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. And how did they figure that out? It's the cause and effect. Thing, right? they said, they looked at every single person trying to figure out what the common denominator was. And they said, everyone with a glioblastoma had a panorex radiograph. That must be it. Because everyone had it. So everyone was probably driven to harm, too. But that was their, they pulled that research quickly because when they fired the person, they did the research quickly. It's absolutely a problem, right? Um, but again, there's, there's, we don't really know why it happens. It's, a, it's an immune response. We know that. We just don't know kind of what the trigger is, but it happens. And so if you see it, uh, just get a scan of it. I can tell you, it, you know, and then the other question is, do you treat it or do you not treat it? That's another good question. And the answer is a good question. I saw one yesterday. I said, you know what? Um, it was a, it was a, a presentation. I should put it in there because it was really interesting. It was a, and we scanned it. it. It had resorption on the inside of the tooth. It wasn't terrible. It was noticeable. It's tooth number twenty four. Um, and they said well, this is internal resorption because there's no external factor to it. We scanned it. There was a lateral canal where there's no bone. There was a little lateral canal. It's like maybe that is a border entry because internal resorption has a very well well certain circumscribed, real, real defined pattern. When it looks really moth-eaten like this, nine out of 10 times, it's nine out of 100 times. Or maybe 9,999 times. It's, it's, it's external, right? Um, but internal is very specific. It looks, it'll go down and it'll almost go, it just goes, it just makes a little, usually makes a little circle and keeps going. Um, so it's case, cases like that, you think, well, do I, do I do a root canal on it or not? Well, if you look at this on the scan, it looks like Swiss cheese. So am I going to get it cleaned out all the way? Probably not. You know, even with some of the protocols we have now. So, well, say General Wave, which I don't know if you've heard of General Wave. It's a new irrigation type of device to use on the tube. Uh, even if you get it cleaned out that way, the problem is it's just it, external has an external component that you cannot clean unless it's surgical. So, and then, so for me, a lot of times, depending on what's going on, is let's just, let's just, I'm going to scan you in six months. I'm going to scan you every year after that to see. How it goes, there's a real good chance the tooth's coming out. Because I found that the majority of external resorptive defects, we talk about fractures, are kind of the same thing depending on the scenario. Uh, uh, we, I'd like to have a sure thing, you know, as close to a sure thing as possible versus going, let's give it a try and see if it works. Uh, I don't, and I just, I know what I know. I know what I know. I know that I'm not, this is definitely not a root uh, canal, this is an extraction. <clears throat> So how about this? You know, it's, uh, that's not my not my case. It was sent over. That's easy to say, right? Not my case. Um, let's take an let's change it up a little bit, look around, see if it maybe changes, see if there's something that we can uh, do to fix this. So you know, multiple floor perforation. Now what do we do? Yeah, who failed me on this one? Um, it's again, it's, it's really easy to point fingers. You know, the person I was doing it, that's that's all they told. I am a resident. I used to teach at the dental school. I stopped a couple months ago. Um, but I had one of my residents last year. It was a case similar to this. And he came in and he, he was, he, he's a nice person, but he just, he was very confident, very full of himself, and was really quick to throw other people under the bus. I, I can't believe you do that. I would never do that, right? It's like, 
well, guess what? We're all human. That's not going to happen. He was just really, he was back away from the patient and, and the medical student and was just lambasting, just really just coming down on this poor kid. And the kid's already having a hard time. It's his first root canal ever had the perforation. And he's, he's making fun of this kid away from him. It's like, you're talking behind his back. I went, so I said, Nate, tell me something. Um, Whose pro who's, who's problem is that? Who, who failed? He goes, well, he did. I said, no, you did. He goes, why do you say that? I said, who's, who's, he, who's covering him? I said, me? Were not you watching him or were you just hanging around talking with everybody? I said, you know, this, this is his first root canal. He didn't know. And, and you, you're over here joking around. I know you're covering a lot of students, but I said, I'm blaming you more than him. I mean, accidents happen. A lot of times we can fix these things, but don't come back here. Making fun of him, which is first group, you know. You're covering him. It's your fault. You take you you take the heat on this one. He still he still didn't understand it. He never understood it until the day he graduated. Oh, I, I wish him well in the best of luck. But but it was it's if I'm not doing my job to help educate, um, and something happens, I screwed up. I screwed up, and we all have this in life. Um, then this, this is my fault. So that's why that's why I like doing what I do. Is to, if, if, if you if you guys can walk away with just one thing today that you remember, you know, you know what? And you see someone on Monday, hey, you know what? I remember from, from Friday something. My job's done. How about this one? So I, I answer some questions to the Minnesota Board of Dentistry. Uh, Angie, my, my Dr. Ray, up in Minnesota, she will uh, send me some things and say, "What do you think?" And she, and she didn't have to send me this one and say, what do you think? She goes, check this out, right? Like, cool, what happened there, right? So it was, it was care, I'm not blast and carrier-based. I've got friends of mine that are endodontists who use carrier-based techniques. That's fine. Problem is, you put a little sealer in there, you pump it a few too many times, this is what happens. But the crazy part is that the dentist recognized that it happened. And he said, oh, I'm going to fix this. And the second slide down, ground it. Went in to do an ape, tried to do an apico and clean out the, the sealer, the mess that was there. And thought, well, that'll, that'll work fine. The patient's got paresthesia and burning. You no, know, all these terrible things that come out of this when you have a sealer, especially a resin based sealer in the inferior airway canal, um, these, are, these are bad, right? So, what, what do you do with this case? I, I, had, a, I had a case similar to this. I, I was an expert witness on two cases. In my life, one of my really good friends who's a pathologist, he's a forensic dentist, he said, man, go, go try it. Just see what you think. He loved it. His name is Mark Bernstein. And Mark is the number one leading guy in the world on bite mark analysis, right? And it's becoming less and less popular with the DNA. This guy, just he, he can get up in front of the crowd. And he can, he, 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 he owns the courtroom when he's in there. But um, so I had a case. I looked at him like, yeah, this, this dentist did nothing wrong. I will defend the dentist. I'll always defend the dentist. I'll never go against the dentist. It's just not who I am. Uh, the person I was going against the dentist actually had just graduated the dental school. He was an expert witness for this, this, this patient that hired by a trial lawyer. Uh, it, was, it was an easy case to win. Um, but I thought, I don't want to do that again because it's hard sitting there in front of a, a trial lawyer that just, they're nice one second and then they're absolutely the devil. Two seconds later, talking with you, just pulling on you the whole time. But you just stick to your guns and you know the rules, you know the, 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 the research, and it's easy. But I had a case come in like this. Um, a week after I finished that case, and I said, Will you take this case too? The same dentist. I was like, That's the case, you know, two cases and no amount of time. But it looked like this. And I said, it, Not quite this bad. And, and I said, I, I'm not going to know. I said, Whatever that patient needs, please get them the help they need. Whatever it is that they're asking for, I would probably say go ahead and pay them. That's that's just that's negligence, uh, and I just I would, I would I refuse to. I think you're not you're not you shouldn't find a dentist in the world that's going to represent the dentist. It's just, it's just, it, you can try to walk through it. I don't know I don't know how to do it. I'm not your guy. Whew. This is probably a funnier text or a funnier meme when I was down in Texas. You know, so you can give me a couple down there. But Walker, Texas Ranger, and the Chuck Norris. Um, is uh, I, got, I got a couple smiles on that one. I'm gonna fill a couple smiles on the last. I thought it's funny. So, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, so this is you know, how do I do a root canal, right? We're 
going to roll through it. Diagnostics, and it's, and this is a huge part of it, right? Diagnosis, um, also you know instrumentation, like the first the first three. The first one is key, and then from there we'll get into that this afternoon as well. Uh, certainly with instrumentation, arbitration, closure, seal, and all that. Uh, but we're going to spend We'll take a break in a half an hour. Is that okay? Uh, let's talk about diagnosis. So clinical endodontic diagnosis. Uh, so right, we'll be doing these things in the SOAP format. So subjectively, we're going to go in there, walk in. The first thing that I do is I walk in, I ask the patients a ton of questions in our software that we use. It's just all listed out. It makes it easy. A lot of times, uh, my assistants will walk in first, ask them a bunch of questions, take a radiograph, CBCT if they decide to. But we're going to ask these things. We're going to want to know exactly what we're looking at that's going to help us with our diagnosis. So the history of the pain, you know, when did it start? Um, has it been there? Um, the location of the pain, where, where does it hurt? Some of the hardest ones a lot of times are, where does it hurt? You get these, right? Where does it hurt? Right here. Oh boy, this one's hard, right? And, and let me, I'm going to jump ahead and step on back. Um, Sometimes no treatment is an option, even though the patient's in pain. You never want someone to leave in pain, but if you can't figure out the reason why they're hurting, the, the two options are refer to someone that you think it might be. I'll refer to oral surgeons. I'll refer to periodontists. I'll refer to oral, oral medicine guys. I'll refer to pathology. I'll refer to, uh, you know, we've got uh, oral fish pain specialists. We have two within a 60-mile radius. We have two of them, and they're trained. One of them trained with Jeff Ocus and Jeff Ocus and Wright wrote the book on oral facial pain. I trained with him for about a month, which is not much, but <clears throat> he's now the dean of the dental school at UK. So getting into him is about impossible. He called me a favor one time. I called him in August. He said, I'll do you a favor. I'll, I'll bump him in. We'll see him in August. I'm sorry, we'll see him in October. August, October. That was doing me a favor. And I understand because he's booked out of here. Um, but it was a try job on neuralgia. And the guy's like, I'm going to kill not a question. I'd like to walk out here. This is short. Send them over. Um, but stepping on back. So to say that there's a lot. There there are times, a couple times a year, if I cannot figure it out, if it's a lot of different things. Say, I said I'm gonna. You know, if I've tried every single instrument in my armamentarium to make them feel better, if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. It's okay that I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I don't have all the answers. Um, and if I don't know, I'll say, you know what? Can you give me a couple of days? If it, if it localizes between now and then, call me. I'll get you right in. If not, sometimes you just have to go, let's just let's figure out where this goes. Because sometimes it will localize, sometimes it won't. If it doesn't, it can also be a non-endodontic problem, right? So we do a root canal on a non-endodontic problem. You end up doing another root canal on a non-endodontic problem. You end up extracting it too. Apparently you extract it. And you see, you see these cases. I had a root canal, they don't work. I had a root canal, I did another root canal, I did another root canal. Extraction, 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 implant, 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 and just working through the system, not identifying the problem. And next thing you know, you've got all this time and money spent, and we're still in pain because it's something other than it's rare. But those are things we really want to look out for. Severity of pain. So, you know, is it really is, you know, you, you know that the, the, one of the telltale signs of a tooth going south is they walk in with a big cup of ice water. They're excusing themselves to use the restroom every 10 minutes because they're sitting there taking a sip. That's the only thing that makes it better. That's almost half the mnemonic of uh, a tooth that's, you know, when you access the tooth, it's pus on the top and nerves in the, in the bottom, and it's super hard to anesthetize them, but that's, that's what's going on. Um, so, severity of pain can be anywhere from no pain to, you know, I had shit last time I was out here, it was in January. I think told you the story before. told you. Um, but it was um, at shingles, at shingles the night before. So at midnight, I go, uh, my wife looks at me, she says, um, you okay? I'm like, I'm not okay. I'm going to the hospital. I heard that bad. Never heard so bad in my life. I've had, like I said, motorcycle wrecks, car wrecks, all this stuff. This was the worst pain I had in my life. We go to the ER. As I'm sitting in the ER, this rash appears right here. I sat there until 7 in the morning thinking, well, at least maybe I can get like an antiviral or something. They were busy seeing real, real emergencies, heart attacks, things like that. So uh, 
seven o'clock, I went home, called my provider. They sent in an antiviral, picked it up. Noon, I was on a plane up to San Francisco. Um, so we went to wine country. Uh, all I remember is um, the severity of pain was the most pain I've ever had in my life. And it was funny because I talked to a lady one time and she said, oh, I'd rather have a childbirth than a shingles. I'm like, I don't believe you, but okay. Because I've heard people come in with two things. And they go, I'd rather have childbirth than two things. So, it has, so that's severity. It's a severity scale. So for me, it's shingles. That's, that's all I know. <coughs> Nature of the pain. Is it a, is it a, you know, is it a dull pain? Is it a sharp pain? Is it, is it a, uh, what, what is it? Do you like? A lot of times they can just describe it. Sometimes they can't. So you can kind of, kind of hint a little bit um, on the nature of it. Usually in endodontics, if I just, if, and there's always a, it depends moment to it, but it can be either a dull throbbing pain or a sharp stab. Two kind of the main categories to kind of taper off from there. Frequency of the pain. Does it hurt all the time? Does it hurt when I eat? Does it hurt when I drink? Does it hurt? You know, is when does it hurt? Uh, the spontaneity of the pain. Is it? Are you just sitting there and all of a sudden I don't know where? Wham! It hits. It's, there's no trigger to it. Where is there a trigger? I saw a trigeminal neuralgia patient on Monday, and same thing. I was looking at her. She had some root canals, and I'm like, oh, this doesn't sound like that. She was aware of what was going on and she was sitting there and she goes like this also she goes oh there it goes and one thing they remember is that's a trigger it's one of the number one triggers for trigeminal neuralgia is it but on the maxilla is is uh, they get an itch they do that and it turns it on it, it fires up real quick so uh, that's not a spontaneous spontaneous pain that's actually triggered by a stimulus of just pressure not a root canal but just pressure what I ended up doing with her to rule out any other problems because you see the teeth, you're like, ah, maybe there could be or could not be. Where does it feel like it's coming from? She's like, everywhere but right here. So I just selective anesthesia. How does it feel? No difference. Gave her a PSA. No difference. PSA. Numbed up her whole maxilla, both sides. It's pain still there. Guess what? Not a root canal problem. Right? Hold up, Jeff. Focus needs to be. Anybody you can see her? Yeah, how about October? Right? So I was like, please, please help me out here. And I gave her a list of the two other guys in town who are have both retired and come back because everyone says they're not allowed to retire. How about that? Right? So I'm ready to tell. Um, and the duration, how long does it last? Does it last a few seconds? Does it last a few minutes? Does it last hours? That's another thing we're looking at when we're trying to figure out you know, kind of long term what, what's the right answer. And this is, it's, again, this is objective. When, if someone says, what well, lasts, I drink something cold or hot in the last couple of seconds. Okay, it's usually not dependent, but usually not endodontic in nature. It's something else. Ideally, it can be endodontic. Uh, if it lasts, my, my, when I'm doing my testing, if it's more than 15 seconds. If it's 15 seconds, it's a minute. It's almost like there's no right, there's no like, but it's 14 seconds, we don't need to look now. We don't need this or whatever changes our diagnosis. But ideally, I tell patients, if it's lasting longer than 15 seconds, and I've heard people say 30 seconds, I've heard people say 10 seconds, and I've heard people say, all, if there's a number. My number is 15 seconds. If it lasts more than that, like I said, if it lasts 15 seconds, they're still hurting a minute later. It's just, it's just, it's just what it is. Uh, and then you want to compare them as well, right? You want to make sure you can compare them to the other teeth. Objective. Um, I said something earlier. Subjective is what the patient is telling you, but objective is what we're going to on right now. I don't know if I, I said that backwards or not when I was talking. Hopefully I did. But objective is what we're going in there. We're doing our testing. This is what we're finding out, which is the truth, right? We started with a clinical examination where we started extra orally. As soon as the patient, as soon as we're looking, as soon as the patient's walking in and I'm meeting them, I'm looking. I'm just scanning them up and down, looking all over, judging. I'm just, I'm just scanning, 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 looking for asymmetry, looking for anything different or, or other than. You no, know, I know when you're in dental school, every time you meet someone, they go, what are you doing? I'm in dental school. Oh, don't look at my teeth. Ah. It's like, I'm not really interested. Yeah. But, um, but I'm always, you know, visually, I'm on, I'm, on the, I'm on the clock, so I'm looking for anything extra orally that might be different. Then we go intra orally. We're looking around at all the teeth, looking for missing teeth. We're looking at, we're looking at, if I look at, 
the lower right side where the pain is, I'm also looking at the lower left side. Honestly, I'm thinking I'm scanning everything, right? And by then we have we should have imaging as well. So I'm looking at the imaging to try to compare left and right, up and down, to see if there's anything different. <coughs> Comparative testing is extremely important. Um, I had someone come up, someone come over the other day and they said, do a root canal on number 29 and number 31. And I looked at number 29, virgin tooth, nothing wrong with it. 31 had a big fracture in it. You know, and we had to figure that out. It's like, is this treated or not? They, they wanted me to do a root canal on 29. I said, why, why do you want a root canal on number 29? Or why do they want a root canal there? Oh, there's a there's a lesion on the on the extract. So you know exactly what it was done to. Yeah, mental foramen, right? That mental foramen can be a lot of different places, but if it shows up at the apices of one of those teeth, then it's lab. So we need some different imaging. We also need to do some testing, some comparative testing. Touch cold in the tooth, obviously it's vital tooth. No symptoms. We're not going to do it. Let's save you, let's save you some, some time and money. We're not doing a root on that tooth because it doesn't need it. Um, a lot of times we'll touch cold to a tooth and you get no response. You know, and sometimes we can say, oh, it must be any problem. And then you touch cold to the next tooth and it doesn't respond. Well, that must be any you can go and 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 I always I always ask them. So yeah, can you eat ice cream without any like chills or any kind of problem? Oh yeah, yeah. Well done, not me. Let's get another test done, right? <clears throat> Otherwise, we can let go. Oh, those that whole quarter needs all those teeth I tested need to test. Did they respond? Did they respond to cold? That's just a piece of the puzzle. And we can check. I've had people tell me you can't do a cold test under a crown. You can. I've heard you can't do an EPT or a bunch of cold tests under a crown. We can, there's just ways to do it. We can talk about that as well. Um, but we just want to compare and see if there's vitality in the tooth, right? Uh, and then do a radiographic assessment. So when we're looking at radiographs, like if I'm, at, if I'm looking at a, a panorex, uh, I'm scanning the maxilla, I'm going under the jawline, and I'm just, then I, I look at everything and then I'm looking at the teeth last. So we're just kind of going out in the big, and then looking in. And like, even if they said uh, tooth number 30 is a problem, I'm still going to look at everything. So I just, I just have a pattern that I, very um, This is, uh, and I've gotten this, and, I, and I, my referrals are the best. I love my referrals. Um, and sometimes I'll get things that come in, and they'll, I, I, this was a picture, I, this was a text I received one time, and they said, What do you think? It was just, it was, What do you think? <laughs> you tell me, what, what do you think? So I need to know if they need a root kill or not. I see the picture. <clears throat> now I've got, and this was on my phone, so imagine how small it was. Can, can we see it? No, we just want to figure out before we send them over to New York. Can you tell me more? No, they just start. I saw the picture, it looked funny. Well, yeah, it does. Uh, so this is this was not a good idea for a, a baseline to do that. Nor is this. Uh, this was a text again taken on a view, but it was sent over just like this. What do you think? <laughs> it's like, I, uh, uh, yeah. It, it, my answer is always, can I can I see that? And if it's if it becomes something of, well, they don't want to waste the money. Let me see as it we just don't want to it. You know, if we need to figure it out, if they need a root canal, we'll talk to them. We'll figure it out. If they don't, I said, same with CBCTs. You know, if they've already they come with a CBCT, um, I, most of the time I won't read it. And the main reason is their full field of view and the, our ability to detect rate, uh, fractures. On a full field view. So if we look at that, Bruno wrote an article. It was a great communique where it said, "Thanks for no thanks." And the reason is, I'm like my, I have a Jay Marita uh, that I know how to use, and I can use it with my eyes closed. I know everything about that from top to bottom. Sometimes something will come in from maybe Care Stream or from uh, Serona or somewhere, playing back up, and this, they give me the thing. First, I've got to figure out how to download the software, and I figure out how to download it. And I did that. I had someone just Great guy, new guy for me, came in with two scans. He goes, I need you to look at those and tell me what you think. What do you, what do you think? It, took, it, it took me an hour and a half to download the one. I thought, can I just have them come in? No, they don't want to come in. So I, I'll, do it, I'll do it for free. Right? I'll, I'll scan them for free. That's, I, that's fine. If you want me to figure it out, I'll figure it out. But I, I just I don't want to waste three hours of my time to look at something for 15 minutes. Um, I just think my time is valuable, as we all, all of us are. I had to figure out a nice way to say it because I don't want him to come over with every single scan going, read this, read this, read this, read this. 
I, I just think that I'll, I would like to take my own stand. Uh, if we're worried about radiation dosage, like the dosing geometry on that, the reality is, is we had a, a radiation physiologist come in when we first had it installed. And we look at, when we're looking at the amount of dosage with um, a, a CBCT, cerebral digital radiograph. Now, on this stuff, we use shift for digital radiography. It doesn't matter to the point us. But, you know, Alara, we, as dentists, we, here's the, here's, here's what the government says we're allowed to give until we start getting into problems. So there's a problem where we might have a problem with cancer, right? Or skin mutations or whatever it is. And the ADA said, awesome, let's do 10% of that. Everyone says this, our, our numbers that we work with in the community are 10%. That's it. Everyone in this room, we're at 10% of that number, right? And so <clears throat> to get to that 10% number, the radiation physiologist came in and said, how many of these can we take with Chris, you standing right here next to it, to where you get to that 10% in a day. Give, 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 me, a, give me a guess. Anyone know? How, how, many, how many CBTs can I stand next to a day before I get that 10%? For my machine? 3,200. I'll take that in here, right? So, okay. so let's do it back six feet. 30,000. Right? So, with that, I still have one of my girls still high, just, you know, gets behind everything. I don't know, and that's her, that's her right. That's her, you know, that's fine. I'm not going to change your mind. But I can I can take those, and it's not going to be an effect. You know, when the patient leaves, I, I usually say we've got a blacktop parking lot. I was like, if you stand outside for about 20 seconds, get into your car after you're done here, you're going to get a whole lot more radiation than I'm going to give you here today. That's a fact. Flying out here yesterday, being up in the sky, I got a lot, right? A lot of radiation. That's okay. I'll be fine. It's, uh, those are just some thoughts it's when we're looking at kind of dosage about what to be concerned about, what not to be concerned about. With our Schick sensor, they took their little dosiometer, their Geiger counter, right? They set it right here. We set our sensor down, we put a tube in here. She put the, first she put it away, uh, about two feet away. They scanned it, no reading on the, on the machine. She put it right there, beep, no reading on the machine. She's like, this doesn't work. Well, what's that picture for? Where'd that picture come from? We're, we're, we're doing a picture of a, a paper clip. And it showed up a paper clip. She thought that's crazy. This was, that was back in 2003. All right. Um, this is just something that we're going to work at later but when we're talking about CBCTs as well. When we're looking here, um, patient came in, they were having pain and discomfort. And we're trying to figure out what's going on. When I look at this, Area, the first thing that I'm looking at, obviously, I look at the bone, I look at the bone levels compared to the grounds, and I'm starting to look up, I look at 31, I see a rather large restoration. It doesn't really closely approximate the nerve. When I look at um, number 30, you go up, and, and just to kind of work through it, the mesial uh, root tip, you know, maybe there's something going on there. It's a little tight, and there's a problem there. That's vital. Um, I start thinking about right there on the furcal areas, there's some resorption there. I'm just kind of looking at this going, well, why is there pain here? This is just an initial look. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. We'll get back to that. So objective findings. So, so the, we do comparative testing. The way we do it, uh, the first thing that I'm looking at is endo, uh, cold tests. I use endo ice. You can use CO2. Uh, does anyone have a CO2 tank to do ice testing? Yeah. I had, one in, I had one in my office at first. That's legit. I mean, it works great, right? It's awesome. It's, it's cumbersome, but if it's what you're used to, and, and honestly, it's, I'm getting the same response as Endo Ice, uh, it's, and, but you've got something that's going to last for 20 years, right? I, and I'm buying those, those kind of $30 cans every, every week, right? So uh, why is investment? Um, uh, ice, just regular ice. Uh, Steve Clark, who was my program director, would take old carpels and he would go up that's another good way to do it as well. Uh, so there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, I use endo ice. Uh, sometimes I use a content applicator. Usually I use a, a cotton pellet. Uh, lately I've been using a sponge. Those little sponges, like those little endo, uh, where the Jord Jordco makes them. Uh, the endo rings, they're the little sponges. We'll take those and, and cut them up. Those show, the research will show that that actually, the cold will last longer on that sponge than it will anything else. So that's really a nice trick to use if we want to test multiple teeth instead of one person. 
That's the bad part about a content application to analyze. Is it a spray? If I'm, uh, I'll explain to the patient what I'm doing. I'll spray it. And as soon as I get here, they get a question, and they'll talk. And answer the question. And then, like, as soon as they get close, they start talking. <laughs> so if I found it, I'm just like, let, let me, let me, if you hear, I just need five seconds, you know, please. And, and, and so otherwise, it, it, it gets too warm and it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, but that's a great, uh, that's my first test. Uh, hot. Every time I see this one, I think I got to make those letters white and I keep forgetting to do it. Um, hot is gutta percha or a heated instrument. Here's the thing about gutta percha. Like here on, on the picture over there, it's a little it's a little plug of gutta percha that is off the face. It's real hard and heat it up. Take it with a lighter or something, heat it up. Really, really important if you ever do this test is put Vaseline on the tooth because if 100% will stick to the tooth, they will not come off very easily. And patients do not like that because they will feel the hot and it's not comfortable. So Vaseline on the tooth. I have a um, like right on here. So the, the down pack unit, you can set it. Uh, for you can crank it up and you don't want to do it too long, but you can actually use that with a larger tip. You can activate it and touch it on this kind of touch it on the tooth and that will heat up the tooth as well. That's a nice way to do it as well instead of heating up an instrument. But that's just an instrument you can use to do it as well. That's one of my that test I probably do 20 times a year. I don't do it on every patient. I just that's usually I can figure out what's going on with every test. Excuse me. Uh, we're looking at perioprobing. What is the electric pulp test? Does everyone have an electric pulp test? If you're doing testing. When you're not getting a very good, when you're not getting a very good response from the cold or anything else, I'll grab the EPT to see, especially if you're touching cold and every single tooth is not responding to cold at all. No response, but you have a suspicion that there's a tooth that is the one, um, and it's got a crown on it. They have a tip adapter that just looks like a point. And instead of a flat tip, it's got a point. And you can actually go down under the crown margin, and it, you'll get a response to the EPT out of that as long as it's touching something on the tooth instead of the crown. Sometimes, even if it's just on the collar, it, it will, it'll actually pick up sometimes. The reason I, the way that I do it is every EPT has a, uh, a ground on their lip, I, so I leave it on the table. I'm, I hold the, the EPT, I hold the pen. The one that I have is made by Cybron. I think I still make it, but I, I make myself the ground. And so what I do is I hold the pen, and I take my glove off, and I put my finger on anywhere somewhere here on skin, and I touch it to the tooth, and if it's working, you'll know because at about 50 out of 80, it'll start kind of tingling in your hand, in your finger. And at about 80, you'll, you'll go, oh, we're done, because that's maxed out, but it kind of hurts, right? So you're, it's, you're, you're completing the loop between the tooth, through the tooth, back to your finger, and you'll know it's working. And if you get no response at all, then you, you're, you know that there's no mobility there, so you're talking about. We're looking for mobility. I'm not a big fan when I look at a tooth that's depressible. I look at those and I think, this is probably not a good idea, right? It's, it's, it's been a big pool of, big pool of uh, pus in there. And just if it's like mobile, loose, and squishy, those are usually coming out. I mean, you can you know, they say, oh, make a blind pig find an ape or whatever once in a while, which means that you might get lucky and save the tooth. There's a real good chance you're not going to. So that, that's something when I look at mobility. If, I'm, if it's depressible, there's something else going on. Either the infection is too far, too bad, too much bone loss, uh, just not a good idea. Swelling, we'll talk about later in our in our diet in our. Uh, one of our diagnostics. So checking upon fracture, checking with fractures, we've got pain upon release. What does that mean? We all know this, you know, you take it like a kind of dip here and bite down, everything's fine, let go, ah, that hurts. That's, it used to be one of those things where if that was the case, 100% of the time it's fractured. It's not, not always the case, but it, there's a high degree of chance that there is a fracture of the tooth and pain upon release. Uh, percussion palpation, when I percuss the teeth, Palpation is more of just on the buccal gingiva. When I'm when I'm percussing, uh, I hear it all the time. Hey, hey, don't tap on the tooth. Why not? It really hurts. Which tooth is it? I'll point to the. I'll always ask them. Point to the tooth. Which you think it 
this and I'll point to it. I'll say, I'll say, I'm just going to take my finger. And I'll take my finger and I'll press on it and wiggle it versus tap on it. So friends of mine, I'm always calm up. I'm like, yeah, don't, don't do that because it hurts, right? We, we want to try not to hurt the patient. We want to figure out there's a fine balance between the two. Um, but I'll press on the tooth and wiggle it. I may press a little bit harder. And I'll start with a, a, a mirror handle and just lightly tap and kind of work my way up on the teeth. I always start with uh, the uninvolved teeth. So I want to get them accustomed to what is normal, what the normal is. And sometimes you tap on teeth. They're, they're a big clencher and they've got one tooth going south, but they've maybe got a lot of restorative care. You might you might tap on four teeth and they all hurt. You know? and a lot of times what will happen is if there's a tooth becoming a product, it's super erupting, you got that traumatic occlusion. At night, they're sitting there grinding. You know, they're sitting there grinding and next, next to them, they've got teeth on either side affected as well. So you got to kind of differentiate between which is the main tooth and what's maybe a brand new product. I always start out on the outside and work my way towards. Sometimes it's just if they say this is a tooth, I'll start on the tooth in front of it and go to the tooth behind it and get them give away to that tooth. Obviously, we want to figure out as soon as possible what um, what's 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 wrong. You know, a lot of times the same thing. You'll do a cold test and you ever get this? Start with a cold test, spray the cold. They go, no, 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 you're not doing that. Well, it's so I tell you what, which tooth is it? And I'll point to it and I'll say, can I check the teeth on either side of the pole? And get used to that normal. So, okay, so now we know this is normal for you. Can I check that other tooth now? Very quick and gentle about it. And then I've got anesthetic waiting to go. They can take the mouth short sure. and kind of work them into that, that comfort level. Uh, images, they must be current and show the surrounding tissues. Sometimes you get thick radiographs, so they'll be sent. You know, we're fine with people saying, hey, we took, we took a radiograph today. Can we send I don't have to be the one that presses the button, so I'm fine with that. But if I have if I have a radiograph, like I said, that that resorption case, that was weeks, you know. So I had, I had a radiograph a month ago. I don't want a new one. Things can change. So it's you know if if it's not within honestly, if it's not within a couple of days, I'll, I'll always take a new one. And I find that the most important thing, the most important reason that they don't want to is finances. If that's the case. So, you know, I get it. You had one a month ago. It's, it's on here. It's on there. And they always go, okay, fine. Every single time. So here's the CBCT. This was uh, in, I had another Indiana office besides my one in Floyd's Knobs, which is funny because, so literally, I was kidding around earlier. So if you drive into Floyd's Knobs from the, the east, the sign says Floyd's Knobs. If you come in from the west, it says Floyd Knobs. They can't get it right. It was amazing. That, like there are two different names on, on the sides on the other side. So this is a little bitty. This is a cute town. It's probably this is a country town, but I was close enough to a bunch of cities that people drove in for hours. Yes, it was, it was, it was a beautiful facility. This is another office I had in Indiana, um, and this is uh, just that's that's the machine we have. So that Jay Marita, that's me sitting there just acting like I'm reading something for, for a photograph. But um, but these things are. To me, they're invaluable. Um, here's why. This was this was sent to me by my friends up in Minnesota. Um, having some pain, palpation, when it's really slow on the buckle. You know, it's you know, maybe it looks a little off center. That's kind of weird. Something is off, something's weird. Do we redo this? What do we do? Um, that was the scam. Yeah, that, that's no that's no good, right? So that that's the problem. Um, they ended up taking the tooth out. I'm not a big fan of herodontics, but I, I look at that and I kind of go, yeah, I mean, could you save it? Probably. Patients probably not at that point, though. It's, it's, it's out of here. I don't, it, it, that's, that's, not a, that's not a practice builder. So, but that without the CBCT, I mean, you could feel something. Something was weird. It's like that saves you enough time from getting there, pulling everything out, and trying to figure out what's going on. It's, that's, that's easy. It's, it's a pretty good roadmap. Everything going on and save, save the time. Uh, we're getting back to this one here, trying to figure out what's going on here. So, we did a 3D scan of it, and one thing that I see is uh, purple bone loss for sure. Um, that's about all that shows up here on number 30. Well, this is one I just kind of, it's like a tease, right? It kind of goes on. I never quite finish it until later. Here's another one. This is a great, this one was sent to me. There was a, a sinus tract. 
over here on the buckle. A um, couple things that I see on this one. There's incomplete obturation, so we've got a problem here. Just it's the technique that's used when you stick a piece of gutta percha here and a piece of gutta percha here. Got a little bound up there. There might have been vital tissue when it was done. Um, there's a little bit of bone loss here, here, and obviously right here. Uh, how do we fix that? You know, what do we do? Uh, <coughs> the techniques we have, and we scan this one afterwards to kind of see it and get an idea. When properly done, you end up with this. So we have. Same thing, this shows up really nice. So when we're using a, 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 like a thermoplasticized a, a gutta percha that is flowable with the Alturna machine with the, with the backfill, we can do here, we can go in here with the bias, we can clean it out, irrigate it. You can see here, this is the portal of exit. There's the portal of exit here. There's, it's, it's really faint, but there's a little uh, canal right there as well. But you get a nice result, heals up and um, save the tooth. Right? Otherwise, if we just took a breathing graph, it looks like it. There are reasons why they fail, and that, that was the reason. Just imagine that cesspool down there. All right, um, assessment. So we've got three different things here. We've got when we, before we even touch a bird or a tooth, if we're looking at doing a root canal, we want to know why we're doing it. So we're going to have a pulpal diagnosis. We're going to have a periapical diagnosis, so inside the tooth, outside the tooth, or, or not the tooth, right? So non endodontic pathology. We've got, we've got some choices here. Um, Pulpal diagnosis is divided. This is the current classifications that we have uh, for inside the tooth, right? We've got normal tissue. It's asymptomatic. It's a normal, healthy tooth. Reversible pulpitis. Um, you know, usually you're seeing some caries, but it's a non lingering therm to thermal test. It's not spontaneous. Hurts, but it's not something that it's just a bad sense. Drinks in the cold, it hurts, comes away in a couple seconds. There's a reason for it. And reversible pulpitis. The majority of the time, I'm not doing a root canal on the reversible pulpitis unless it's switching over to an irreversible pulpitis. It's going to the next level. Sometimes I tell patients, one fence, you know, we're going one way or the other. We either we caught it early or it's just kind of where it is. Uh, there's a chance we could fall off the side to one side or the other. I don't know the answer to that. And you, usually in these cases, there's, there's caries. And so I'll, I'll, I'll give them the option. You can go back to your dentist, take your remove the caries, put a filling in, or if you'd like, I'd be more happy to do it under a microscope. And look and see if there's a pulp exposure, you can kind of figure out how to go from there. But if there's a pulp exposure, you're on the side along the wrong direction. You can always do a, always do a root canal. You can take them back, though, right? Or you take the root canal back. <coughs> Excuse me. Symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. If you get reports back from uh, Brenda and honestly, if you work with any, um, if they put SIP, they get the reviewing and everything, SIP, it's symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. It's a vital case. And it's spontane either spontaneous pain or lingering pain, usually severe, if you're to your office for your reason. Asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis. Uh, no clinical symptoms. There, there is inflammation of the tooth, though. It's caused either by caries, trauma, uh, the excavation of the caries. There's a pulpal exposure, but no pain. So that's most, most of the time, I'd say the majority of our cases are either pulpal or either symptomatic apical. Well, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis uh, or necrotic. Those are kind of the two that encompass the majority of the treatment that we're using. Pulpal necrosis. So no response to a thermal or electrical stimulus. Previous root canal therapy. So the canals have been altering at some point. Uh, had a guy, he had root canals in the 90s and he had silver points. I thought, oh, that's, I thought that went out in the 80s. Then I remembered I had a referral when I was in Indiana. And in 2005, he was still doing silver points. And I said, why are you doing silver points? Because I have some left over. <laughs> I said, how many, did you, how many did you order? Right? Do you have a silver mill or what's going on here? That's crazy. No. Please don't do that. Um, and previously, previously initiated therapy, meaning that's either had a pulpotomy or a pulpectomy, something has been in, in, in the chamber moving some component of the inside of that tube. This is a flow chart. I've got the flow charts too. These are great. Like if, if you're just kind of going, you know what, I, I, I'd like to have that. Uh, I have these, I can email them to you. I, I probably have them on my flash drive. Um, but I can always send these out if you all want, however you want them. 
These are great flow charts. If you're sitting there trying to figure it out so you're comfortable with it in your head, this is just a great flow chart to come up with what we're dealing with and how, how do we treat it. Very typical diagnosis. So we've got normal apical issues. So, so, so this normal, normal APC is asymptomatic, intact laminadura, uh, sap, so symptom sap, right? Symptom, reversible bulbitis, apical periodontitis. So symptomatic apical periodontitis, you tap it on the tooth or they're biting down and it hurts. You may or may not have an associated very apical consistency. It doesn't matter. If it has it, if it doesn't have it, all that matters is when I tap on that tooth or they bite down, they say, ouch. That's symptomatic apical periodontitis. Asymptomatic apical periodontitis, there's no pain, but there's a radio, radio loosening area there. Uh, apical apical radio loosening area there. That's asymptomatic apical periodontitis. We know there's a problem with the inside of the tooth causing a problem with the outside of the tooth, but there is no pain. Acute apical abscess. Um, and we see these that come in, they got a golf ball size swelling or inter, in, in, internally as well. Uh, there's localized swelling, pain, there's pus. Uh, it's tender when you press on it. They may or may not have fever. They may or may not have one bad uh, Chronic apical abscess, minimal or no pain, but they've got a sinus tract. They've got pus, you press on it, pus comes out. That's drainage. There's an infection in there. It's just not hurting. The main reason is they have a pressure release valve, right? It's like a pressure cooker. There's a little bump there, but they press, the pus comes out. They keep them in the back. Facial cellulitis, um, <clears throat> like a Ludwig's angina, you know, things like this. Things like this, when they show up in my office, they don't usually, but if they do, um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to punt, but I'm going to properly get them to the place they need to be. I'm not going to open up a tooth with someone that comes in with something like a pill for 24 hours. If, uh, if you're getting, you know, I have had people like that, and I always ask, are you having trouble swallowing? A little bit. The girls hear that, they know they're calling an oral surgeon right now to get them wherever it is they need to get them to get this IV antibiotics and probably get them in a hospital setting to get them taken care of as soon as possible. Um, it needs to be treated very aggressively. I'm not a big fan for saving teeth that are like this. And I was a, I was a senior, a fourth year dental student. I got called into the VA. I, I was going to be an oral surgeon in dental school. That was my thing until about 97. That's exactly what I wanted to be. So I would, I would. I extracted more teeth than anybody in the history of my dental school. Still, the 2,200 uh, 2, teeth in the, in the years I was there, I, was, I, was, I lived at the dental surgery because I just extracted teeth. I loved it. And, and that's, I, I just, so anytime there was something wild, they'd call me up, hey, Chris, can see this? And I was at the VA, and I walk in, in the setting, there's a guy draped, he's out, um, and there was a oral surgeon, oral surgeon, ENT, general surgeon, surrounding this guy's head. And they had cut him open here, flap down here, two peck flaps. He was wide open. And he, it smelled like death. And he had, it was number 21. He went south on him and got treated abscess, got a lot of his angina, spread down here. They're going through, cutting, doing stuff. I see one of the ENTs going through. He goes, oh, clamp. So, just cut the external jugular. You know, I mean, just it was just just bad stuff, right? I lived. I don't know how he lived, but it was just an absolute. I, I finished dental school about a week after that. But I just thought, it was an acute necrotizing dash. Something there between the two. So when I see faust with facial cellulitis, I have flashbacks to this, and I think we're good. Yeah, we need you somewhere else. I'm not. I'm not your guy. Let's see what we got. We might take a break here in a second. So yeah, here's again the flow charts, right? Another great flow chart. Is a tentative percussion, and I'll, I'll bring these up to patients when I'm doing the diagnosis to kind of know what I'm thinking as well. <coughs> um, and we can go through here and we can come up with our diagnosis just based upon this, and then we can say, Do we treat this or do we not treat this? Let's take a break. Let's take a break for I've been, I've been talking more than I probably should, but let's uh, let's go on. We'll talk about fracture here a little bit.